Thank you everyone for joining. Welcome to the Gemini online conference of organized by the 2025 initiative. The purpose of this gathering today is to create collective alignment which can serve as a receptive antenna to receive an impulse coming from the hierarchy and from the Christ to be modified, qualified and adopted and transmitted to humanity. The idea of this gathering was inspired during the Sagittarius meeting of the speakers uh, who represented at the 2025 initiative and today we work with the same energy of Sagittarius, Gemini axis and we focus of the needs of humanity and bring our collective chalice that we create together for the service of hierarchy and humanity. Our facilitator of this conference today is Claire Bainon in New Zealand and as sun rises above the horizon in New Zealand, Claire will lead us in the alignment. Greetings everybody and thank you for your patience with um, my technological hitch at the beginning. Before we do um, our group alignment, I thought I'd just say one or two things too about the purpose of the conference and the format. We're going to be using the model of um, the World Cafe, which is an online community forum um, whose purpose is to foster dynamic, safe, collaborative conversational spaces. While preparing for today, I was linking in with um, Martin Luther King's model of beloved communities and Andrew Harvey's networks of grace and Pope Francis's vision of a revolution of tenderness. And I looked up the word beloved and its definition in the dictionary is dearly loved. So the idea or image of lighthouses around the globe feels so synonymous to me then with the creation of beloved communities. Dearly loved, intimate, familial, local, national and international communities. And I was thinking too of the word meditation and how often when typing it, it ends up on the page as mediation and sometimes the other way around. And each of these words, meditation and mediation, are essential keys in the process of peace building, whether that's on a personal level or on a community level. They seem like a natural pairing, a partnership that's yearning for expression through self-forgetfulness, harmlessness and right speech. When people of like mind and heart gather together in meditation, miracles become possible. At this time of the Gemini Solar Festival, we consider Christ and his disciples meeting long ago in the upper room, the cynical, gathering in quiet communion with each other and with their beloved teacher. The Holy Spirit descended upon them lifting them into new understandings and opening them to new insights. Amongst these, the meaning of embodied love and two of unity through diversity. It seems the incoming Aquarius ethos was already a vision during the time Christ walked the earth in those times in manifested form. The fact the Holy Spirit appeared in the form of a dove and also as tongues of fire 
suggests collaborative partnerships that extend beyond our human-to-human -human relationships and into the lower and higher kingdoms. Kingdoms eager for us to acknowledge they have a vital role to play in the awakening and transformation of humanity. There is some urgency to our partnering with these subtle kingdoms in order to effect positive change and so aid the great ones. What would it be like, what would the world be like, if we could respond to circumstances and each other in embodied Christ love? What might be achieved if we could hold a position of poise, at once horizontally and vertically aligned, and step into being the love we are destined to be? Also, before we go into our group alignment, I want to acknowledge our very dear friend and our co-worker, Jan Dietrich, who yesterday completed her true transition from this world to the next. Many of you online today will know her and will love, have loved her. And I'm sure will agree that she was a woman who embodied Christ's love, whose lifetime of dedicated service so expressed beautifully the world to good. A woman for whom these lines, I think, ring very true. If we live the truth, nothing needs to be told, for our life will be the telling. It's into now our group alignment. As we enter the circle of grace and quiet, we withdraw our consciousness from the personality, its vehicles, its distractions, and we relax deeply and expectantly into the presence of each other and of the group soul. We breathe in the sense of shared purpose and intention. Standing united in Christ's love, we know ourselves as individual souls within the greater group soul. Meeting today as a whole of many parts in a field of lighted love and spiritual will. We visualize for a moment our planet suspended in an infinitude of space, surrounded by a shimmering network of light. This network is a collaborative art picturing of human and divine love, a constellation of protection whose unbreakable connections span time and distance and know only the language of love. This mantle of light lives and breathes in concert with both the heavens and the earth, seeking to synchronize one with the other. Once lit, the lights in this network cannot be extinguished. Should one light pale, another will brighten by way of encouragement. This is a network of exquisite purity, clarity and beauty, whose light can only be augmented, intensified and strengthened. Christ and the Buddha are the master artists at the heart of this network. Brothers in the light, they invite us to collaborate with them in their efforts to extend this network through the will to love. So that through a combination of loving intention and practical action, we might become increasingly effective in terms of bringing light into humanity's dark places. We know this to be a task of considerable urgency and immense proportion. 
We ponder for a moment the mantra of Gemini. I recognize myself, my other self, and in the waning of that self, I grow and glow. The Christ and Buddha represent the West and the East and the spiritual union of these hemispheres. They invite us to take our place within the global community, to manifest light in the mundane yet sacred world of politics, environmental and social arenas, dilemmas and concerns of a deeply human nature. What shapes might this light on earth take? And what might taking our place more fully ask of us? We envision love in its hierarchical sense, free from sentiment, emotion, and personal bias. As love that surrenders and seeks to understand, that acts with strength and decisiveness, and that works on behalf of the whole, rather than in the interests of any group or individual. With heartfelt attentiveness, we listen inwardly, imagining the Christ with us, for he said, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, there am I among them. We imagine the steady and irreversible illumination of humanity and affirm our earth as a sacred, radiant and peaceful station of light transformed by love. And we contemplate for a moment how our work today and in the future might aid in the practical manifestation of Christ's love in the world. And together we say the mantra of unification. The sons of men are one, and I am one with them. I seek to love, not hate. I seek to serve and not exact due service. I seek to heal not hurt. Let pain bring due reward of light and love. Let the soul control the art of form and life and all events and bring to light the love that underlies the happenings of the time. Let vision come and insight. Let the future stand revealed. Let inner union demonstrate and outer cleavages be gone. Let love prevail. Let all men love. We'll move now into the presentation part of the conference. We are privileged and blessed to have four presenters with us this morning, this evening, <laughs> this afternoon. Um, Michael Robbins is our first uh, presenter. Michael's from the USA and two from Finland. He will be known to many of you. I'll read a little bit about his bio. He's um, a co-founder and president of the University of the Seven Rays. 
as well as the director of the Moira Federation School of Occult Meditation, which is the internet expression of the USR. Michael and his co-workers have persistently sounded and sustained the note for sponsoring the USR and SRI conferences now in their 30th year. As a long-standing student and teacher of the Ageless Wisdom, through the study of the Seven Rays, Esoteric Astrology, Cosmology and Rayology, Michael has inspired students worldwide, some of whom have gone on to form their own organizations in an endeavor to continue the spread of the Ageless Wisdom. I would like to add also that Michael has gifted us with a vast library of esoteric writings and an equally extensive and beautiful repertoire of music. On his uh, Moira Federation, um, Federation website, Michael issues us all with an invitation. And I'm quoting from something he wrote there. He said, The Christ is returning, really reappearing, to fulfill his mission as a world teacher in the age of Aquarius. He will need, as willing cooperators, those who understand. He will need those who are willing to put first things first in the system in uplifting of humanity, which in many respects has gone astray through materialistic living. He will need those who are willing to sacrifice the spiritual treasures they have accumulated over many lives or incarnations for the sake of redeeming the human race. He will need you if you can respond to the vision which he presents, a vision leading to an enlightened humanity, filled with spiritual love and spiritual power, a vision of a planet which will become a sacred, lighted sphere within the life expression of our solar logos, the god of our solar system. So welcome, Michael. It's wonderful to have you with us today. Um, the topic of your talk is aligning with the will impulse of Shambhala, Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can, Michael. And can you um, make my screen the presenter screen? I think Alexander can do that from the. Gives uh, my side. We'll, we will do it now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Sasha. Okay, everyone. Hi. I'm very happy to be here with you. And, well, this is a huge subject, you know, and I have about 15 minutes to present it. I'm leaving my notes on the screen, and I'll be happy to share them with you uh, if you if you like. Um, realistically, you know, uh, to align with the will impulse of Shambhala. This is something the masters themselves are trying to do. So for the aspiring initiate, um, the very uh, first possibility of this occurs at the third degree. We get a little bit of a trickle down, you know, and we there are certain things we're told that are necessary, but to really be uh, responsive to the purpose and will of Shambhala, that is another uh, matter. Let's see if I'm, uh, is it uh, strong enough? Okay, a little bit. All right, so really what is required here is that we become responsive at the third degree to the highest aspect of our own nature, the, the monad, the Father in Heaven. Then we can say we're really aligned with the will impulse of Shambhala, and unless all of us do that, uh, find a way to do that. There's no way that we're going to uh, influence uh, humanity to do the same because we must demonstrate the fact in our own nature. So uh, let's try to translate this into terms we can understand. There are many masters of the fifth degree, not, uh, those who are not on the first ray, uh, who, are, who don't have the freedom of the courts of Shambhala. They, they cannot enter. They don't have the right of entry. Only as a group can they uh, begin to respond. So we have to be realistic about this. Shambhala is not uh, somewhere that we can go at this present time. We can't go there, okay? We can't uh, achieve that point of tension that is necessary 
uh, to have what is called entry into Shambhala, although some people imagine that they can. We have to be realistic about this. But what we can do is we can understand, if we try, the divine plan so well in our own scope that we do find a way to express it in our lives. And then, then perhaps, something of the purpose and of the plan can begin to work through us, and especially the divine plan. So let's look at some aspects of the will here, because this is what it's all about. We talk about responding to the will uh, impulse of Shambhala. I think um, the best way to understand the Shambhalic will is through an understanding of the great will to good, which uh, Gemini being, you know, we're told the head of the cosmic Christ, it's a great second ray constellation. So it'll have a very close connection to this will to good. So it's very, very appropriate. Now what I'd like to do is just look at a couple of definitions of this will to good, uh, which Alexander mentioned earlier, so we can have some uh, concept of what it is, probably we already do to a certain extent. This is a beautiful idea here that um, the will to good is in its turn a complete expression of the love nature of deity. It is very related to the second aspect of the will. Here is another one. Um, very important, I think. The will to good is the basic quality of divine purpose involving planned activity and a definite goal to be achieved. It necessitates the ability, now we note this, to think in terms of the whole, an appreciation, uh, an appreciation of the next step which humanity must take in the imminent great approach. Uh, and for this must be a reciprocal approach, an understanding of the lessons of the past, and a vision based not only on love or on soul sight, but on conviction as to the immediate purpose of Sanat Kumara as he works it out through the Christ and the planetary hierarchy. Here's another, um, well, let's just say at the fourth initiation, the will to good dominates. So we realize really that we are uh, far from being able to appreciate it in its fullness. Really, only Sanat Kumara can, and maybe even then only the Solo Logos. Now, the last one I want to show is really um, powerful, I think, very powerful. Uh, DK is talking about contact with Shambhala that the initiate achieves for the first time at about the, at the third degree when the monad comes consciously into impression. He says, I know not else how to express these ideas it is a blinding conviction of an unalterable will carrying all before it. Oblivious of time and space, aware only of intensity of direction, and carrying with it two major qualifications or basic recognitions to the initiate. And these two are very, very important when we think about any response to the will. A sense of essential being which obliterates all the actions and reactions of time and space. Just imagine that for a moment. <laughs> time and space, as we, the, the illusion of time and space, as we usually conceive, are obliterated, blotting out all form. Okay. And a focused will to good, which is so dynamic in its effect that evil disappears. Evil is, after all, only an impelling sense of difference leading inevitably to separative action. So these are powerful um, uh, definitions of the kind of will that we are searching for. Now, uh, I, I want to add one other thought here about this uh, will that's related to Shambhala and to the monad. I call it the will to archetypalization, or the will to archetypalize, which is the will to purpose as it is found on the monadic plane where the highest aspect of our nature is found and later on the, I'll spell it correctly, on the logoic plane. So we search out the archetype which directs all things and that really embodies the divine purpose. Well, this is a big stretch. Let's be honest with ourselves. We don't want to fool ourselves. We want to respond to that aspect of the 
purpose which is possible as it is formulated through the divine plan. And we don't even understand the entire plan, of course not. On the atomic plane, the custodians of the plan are found and they're attempting with the connection to the Nirmanakayas to formulate something of the divine plan which they can understand and which can be used by humanity. So uh, let's look at some aspects of the will that can be fulfilled by ourselves uh, in our groups with the members of the new group of world servers and only later will it be possible for humanity to receive and express a still higher point of the will. Uh, let's deal with aspects of the will which are preliminary to any true experience with monadic will or with shambolic will. We have to be humble about this, you know, really, we use the word shambhala oh, so glibly often, you know, it's, it's on our tongues. But it's a big stretch, even for some of the masters of the wisdom, fifth degree initiates, who are not allowed to contact shambhala directly, except uh, in, in group form uh, under certain types of protection and especially at the Waysack Festival. So let's get that clearly in our minds. Now, in this ascending type of will which is going to lead to our ability to bring in the shambolic impulse, we have the sacrificial will of the soul. That's the very first thing that we have to understand. And I wonder how much we know about sacrifice and the soul. Uh, in, in the egoic lotus, the seventh petal, eighth petal, ninth petal have to be completely open before we can fulfill the curriculum of sacrifice uh, as it is presented to those who understand the third degree and who are entering the third degree. So th these are the initiatory petals, seven, eight, and nine, and we're not there yet. Okay. So let's just admit that, but we're learning something about sacrifice. And we have to remember that the very first law of the soul is the law of sacrifice. Uh, obviously, uh, until we can fulfill the first five laws of the soul, we can't talk about really responding to the pure will of Shambhala in a mediated form through the plan and as it applies to our particular uh, task in life, yes, we can fulfill. But the true will of Shambhala is something else, although it really it boils down to right human relations as far as humanity is concerned. Okay, then, so what we're doing now is we're ascending through different types of will which will lead us to the ability to fulfill in some measure or understand in some measure what shambolic will really is. Okay, then there's the type of will which pertains to the, uh, to the, to the three petals of synthesis, not four, but they are the fourth tier, and it's only possible for us to get this synthetic grasp of things when a big and deep picture of the planetary process is seen uh, after the third initiation and at the fourth initiation. In other words, mastership, isolated unity, all these fantastic um, things, then we can understand what synthesis is. Those petals burst open, we are told, at the fourth initiation, and then some kind of synthesis is really possible for us. Now, he says, don't try to understand the will unless you have in you the spirit of synthesis and can really see the big picture. We should never forget that. The expanding of our consciousness is utterly necessary really to understand the will. Then, there is the, the type of will emanating directly from the seven facets of the egoic, uh, of the, uh, of the jewel in the egoic lotus. Okay, we call it the, uh, the J-I-L, jewel in the lotus of the egoic lotus. So, there are, and I'll just go through them, but you know how important they are, and every time we build the Antikorana or work with that, we have to have these types of will, the uh, will to initiate, Ray one, will to unify, two, ray to evolve, three, ray to will to harmonize, four, will to act, five, will to, uh, no, it's not create, it's cause, excuse me. All right, the will to cause, okay, uh, that's ray six, and the will to express, ray seven. These have a very, very high source, but to some extent they can be absorbed when we're building the Antikorana. Now, this is coming straight from the jewel in the lotus, and we cannot really build the Antikorana 
to the towards shambolic will unless we have these things too. So let's really understand the prerequisites uh, required for us if we're to build towards uh, individually and in our groups and in the new group world servers to really understand shambolic will. Okay, then of course, we must not overlook the spiritual will, which is found on the atmic plane. And this is the will which intelligently guides the divine plan into expression. We're always learning about this. We're always studying this. The custodians of the plan have this. They're the masters of the Chohans. They have this. And the spiritual will comes from a very high place, the atmic plane. Our Antikorana is not really touching that yet, but it will uh, in time. And finally, we can get exactly to the subject that we have here, uh, something which can begin to resemble shambolic will, though not fully at all. It's the will of the monad, which begins its consciously registered expression at the third initiation, and is still more truly expressed at the fourth initiation when the will to good really takes over, monadic will really takes over. At, at, and that time, at that time, we sacrifice everything pertaining to the satisfactions of the lower three worlds and within the realm of soul expression. Also, the egoic lotus and the higher mental plane. So all those things are sacrificed. Everything we aspire to is laid on the altar of the divine plan, which is ultimately the divine purpose. Okay, so a great growth in consciousness must accompany our ability to respond to any of these higher forms of the will. There's no such thing as simply willing ourselves forward into the higher types of will without an expanded consciousness. And the wider and the deeper we can think about the planetary and solar systemic processes, the greater will be our ability to respond uh, to shambolic will and to apply shambolic will. We're not going to get it in the pure form, okay? It is love. It is the will to love. It's the will to good. It's the will to peace. It's all these wonderful things, but these are all mediated forms of the gra that great type of will. We have to uh, in, increase our own receptive capacity and our ability to sacrifice and our ability to express in order really to respond to the higher types of will. Now further than this, there is something called um, the, well, I, I call it the will to identification. Okay, if the will of the monad is really to be expressed, and then the monad has its residency within Shambhala, then we have to know something about identification and be able to do this. Now, how do we do that? It's up to everybody, you know, but basically removing all the barriers which glamour, uh, illusion, and maya have created, and learning how to be like the Christ, who was such a great uh, identifier, we might say, that he knew what was in man. Immediately, no barriers. He was Neptune. He could dissolve all barriers, and he could identify with every human being. The last thing I want to say here is that I recommend that we have to become, in all of this question of the will, sufficiently harmless. I don't know any of us that can claim that we really are. I certainly can't. I've done my fair share of harm in the world, and I know it. But, you know, more and more, we have to be able to understand what harmlessness really is, because it will lead to right human relations, and that's the big theme of Shambhala right now with respect to the human race. So um, let's see, what do I have here? Uh, right, right, right. Yes, therefore, the, I want to quote this, the purpose of the will of God, known and understood in the council chamber of Shambhala, seeks to influence human will. Okay, it is an expression in hierarchical terms as the will to good, and in human terms as goodwill and Note this as loving determination or a fixed intention to bring about right human relations. So the will of Shambhala with respect to us as humanity is to bring about right human relations. Harmlessness and right human relations are in the, uh, uh, well, they, they are inseparably related. So this definition is one that I have uh, memorized by heart by heart, really, and, and I hope everybody, you know, can take the time to do that because it's really worthwhile, and that will be my clo closing point. Harmlessness is the expression of the life of the man who realizes himself to be everywhere, pause there and realize what he's saying, realizes himself to be everywhere, who lives consciously as a soul, whose nature is love, 
whose method is inclusiveness and for whom or to whom all forms are alike in that they veil and hide the light and are but externalizations of the one infinite being you know you could ponder on this for your whole life it it's so filled with deep esoteric realization uh, this realization let me remind you says the tibetan will demonstrate in a true comprehension of a brother's need divorce from sentiment and expediency as claire was saying that love which is divorced from sentiment the keynote of the first day it will lead to that silence of the tongue which grows out of non-reference to the separate self it will produce that instantaneous response to true need which characterizes the great ones who passing beneath the outer appearance see the inner cause which produces the conditions noted in the outer life and so from that point of wisdom true help and guidance can be given harmlessness brings about in the life caution and judgment reticence in speech ability to refrain from impulsive action I could learn that one and the demonstration of a non-critical spirit so free passage can be given to the forces of true love and to those spiritual energies which seem to vitalize the personality leading consequently to right action and so my final point is this that to be truly harmless in the realization of brotherhood with every fellow being with their with their welfare at heart with every fellow beings welfare at heart uh, with every fellow beings next step ahead in mind if we can do this and to realize that we and all fellow beings are and this is a big one all of us externalizations of the one infinite being this would be the beginning of the ability to be truly aligned with the will impulse of Shambhala thank you Michael thank you for a rich offering and lots to think about and ponder and I'd encourage um, everybody attending today to um, have a pencil and paper handy to make notes um, and write down questions that arise during the speakers presentations um, because we'll be taking these into our breakout sessions later um, and there'll be a lot coming through so um, it might be helpful to anchor those on the page Michael thank you thank you sir. Um, our next speaker is Michael Lindfield. Michael's actually away on the island of Iona at this time, so he's without an internet connection, but he's very much with us subjectively and he sends his love to everybody. Um, we spoke with him just before, uh, a couple of days ago when we were preparing. And he has made um, two recordings that we'll share with you today. Just a little bit about Michael for those of you who don't know him. He has studied the Ageless Wisdom and been actively involved in creative meditation since the late 1960s through an affiliation with Sundial House in England and, through, and with Findhorn. He's a highly regarded consultant and coach with over 40 years of international experience in helping individuals and organizations unleash the creativity of the human spirit to meet the needs of our times. Uh, listening to Michael speak during our preparatory session, and again when listening to his pre-conference recordings, I was reminded of a poem by Wendell Berry, it's called A Poem on Hope, and this stanza particularly felt like it um, connected in with what Michael's going to say. Be still and listen to the voices that belong to the stream banks and the trees and the open fields. Find your hope then on the ground under your feet, your hope of heaven let it rest on the ground underfoot. The world is no better than its places. Its places at last are no better than their people, while their people continue in them. When the people make dark the light within them, the world darkens. And when the people make light the dark within them, the whole world lightens. So Michael's very much with us today. The title of his talk is Expressing the essence of the Aegis wisdom and communicating it to the modern world. And Sasha, I think you will be playing the recording of Michael's talk from your computer.
yes for the sharing today so I will consequently play them thank you Greetings, dear friends and co-workers. This is Michael Linfield. I'm unable to be with you in person at this Gemini online gathering. I'm traveling today on a bus from Finholm in the northeast of Scotland to the island of Iona on the west coast. I'm very interested in the theme of today and so would love to offer a few thoughts and place them in the field as my contribution. The theme of, is the alignment with spirit. How do we hold the vertical alignment while expressing it through the horizontal fields of right human relation and skillful action? And how do we bring the vision that inspires us into the world in a way that's understandable, relevant and helpful? So a few thoughts. The image that comes to mind immediately is that of the cross. It has a vertical arm representing our alignment with spirit. It has a horizontal arm representing our relationship with each other, with the world. And we need both of these axes. And then we need to stand at the center of the cross because it's where these two meet that the work is done. When I think of the Rosicrucian symbol of the rose blooming on the cross, the rose being the symbol of the soul can only bloom when the vertical and the horizontal components of life are brought together in a dynamic state of creative tension. If we simply live a vertical alignment, we live with our head in the clouds, we live in a world that is disconnected from the needs of the world. And if we only live in a horizontal world, running around trying to fix the symptoms of what we see happening around us, we don't have access to the power of the causal level, which is the vertical. So when we bring these two components together in our own lives, we become powerful servers. We can bring vision through into action. So what does it mean to bring vision into action? For me, it's the process of embodiment. It's one thing to contact a concept or contact a frequency, contact a quality. It's another to embody it and become it. I'm reminded of Roberto Assagioli and psychosynthesis, where he encourages us to act as if, as if we already had those qualities alive inside us. And so for me, the big word if is like trainer wheels. So when I act as if, I'm practicing the embodiment of that which I know is potential and living inside me. And then when we become proficient, we, we become skilled at cycling or whatever it is, we take the trainer wheels off. The trainer wheels are the if. So instead, instead of acting as if, we begin to act as. And acting as is the path of living discipleship. It's the way that the word is made flesh. It's the way that we bring our vision into action, not just through words, but through being. If I think of how to communicate this, probably for me, because of my background in gardening and organic farming, I go to nature. So when I explain to people, I say, look, there is, a, there is this vision 
of a more perfect union with life. There's a vision of who we are as a potential. That's like a seed that lives inside of us. And then the seed needs to be planted in the soil. And the soil is a certain condition of richness and nourishment that needs to be present for the seed to grow. And the soil really is right human relations, it's love, it's compassion, it's all the ingredients of human living that allow the seed to grow. And then we have to bring the seed and the soil together and we have to be the skillful gardener, the spiritual horticulturalist. And so that means we usually follow a path, a practice that allows us to translate what's on the inside onto what's needed on the outside. So for me, the seeds represent the future that needs to be precipitated. The soil is created out of the richness of the past, all the accumulations, all the lessons learned. And the actual birth and flowering of the spirit and of the vision is always in the present, for there is nothing but the present. So how does the rose bloom on our cross? And the cross, as we know, is a very significant symbol for the earth. The astronomical and astrological symbol of the earth is a cross within a circle. It is the Christ seed crucified or imprisoned at the center of the cross. And the whole plan for the planet earth is the liberation of the Christ force and the Christ presence within matter. This is the return of the Christ within ourselves when Christ is born within the cave of the human heart individually and then collectively as we stand in front of the first initiation together. And when Christ is revealed through the invocative appeal of humanity where we call forth and we create the conditions for the reappearance. We prepare the way, which is really what the 2025 initiative is about, preparing the way. So, living in the present and living from the heart, for me, is the key. The heart is the crossroads. The heart is where we stand and can embrace past, present and future. And the heart is the womb in which this spiritual seed can gestate, grow, and finally blossom. And so I think the easiest way to communicate this as people is to find out their background, where they come from, and then find some useful image or metaphor that makes sense to them. It's like the Master Jesus talking in parables. He didn't stand there and give a whole lecture using esoteric terminology. He gauged the need and he gauged the level of understanding of the audience. And he spoke from the heart in words that registered. Our task is not to convert the world to understand esoteric thinking. I believe our task is to help the world give birth to the Christ consciousness that lives deep within the collective heart. And we do that any way we can. I love the story of a pupil who asked a Zen teacher, Master, tell me, what is your practice? And the teacher smiled and said to him, whatever is needed. So we don't need to be attached to the teachings. We need to live and be the teachings and we need to practice in a way that makes sense in the moment. So those are some thoughts that I have. I would love to be with you to participate in the dialogue. And I will be thinking of you and joining you as I sit on the bus, looking out through the window at the wonderful Scottish countryside, knowing that all around the world, we are preparing the way together for the reappearance of the Christ both as an external presence, but also as a presence that lives within the heart of each one of us.
Thank you. Hello, this is Michael again. I had a thought before I take off for Iona, something I'd like to place in the field as another contribution. Following on from the whole idea of acting as if, if being the trainer wheels, removing the trainer wheels and acting as, it's a journey that we have embarked on that could be called the embodiment of the kingdom of souls. So in order to create the conditions for externalization, I believe we have to go through the internalization of the hierarchy before the externalization of the hierarchy can occur. And the internalization of the hierarchy is when we start to sound the note of the soul, live its qualities, and we become the living field of those qualities. They show up in us individually and as a group. And we become part of the sacred geometry of the universe that is in harmony with the perfected image of humanity. That's We aspire to that, and that's what we're moving towards. And as we do that, we know that the atoms in our bodies change, the frequencies are raised, and we then have an ability to blend the fourth and the fifth inside of us. So the fourth and the fifth kingdoms cooperating is not simply communication, telepathic rapport, getting guidance, uh, whatever the methods have been up to now, I believe we're stepping into an era when the fourth and the fifth need to blend inside of us. And when we think of the new group of world servers as a body that can embody the principles, the qualities and the characteristics of the fifth kingdom, then the new group of world servers becomes a living field through which and in which the Christ can reappear and the externalization can occur. And we actually become part of the real reappearance and part of the externalization because the substance of our etheric group field is part of the incarnational field for this great event. So we can study, and then there comes a time when this word has to be made flesh collectively. And I believe that that, that is our task as a new group of world servers, is to embody in action so that both the horizontal and the vertical arms of this cross are in dynamic relationship. And so right human relations, goodwill, all the things we know that need to flow into the world to prepare the way. When those are embodied inside us and the new group of world servers becomes the living pathway, the group disciple, then the ashram of the Christ has a vehicle through which to cooperate, through which to communicate, and through which to manifest. And we have to see that in humility. And in this case, of course, we know that humility is an adjusted sense of right proportion. We don't overinflate ourselves and we don't underinflate ourselves. But if we can step into the fullness of who we really are, allow the fourth and the fifth kingdoms to unite and blend inside of us, we then become the path of light and love upon which the Christ must walk. So that, that was the last thing I'd, I'd like to add to our gathering today. So thank you, and I will continue to be with you in spirit. What a beautiful contribution from Michael. I loved how he referred to the new group of world servers as um, spiritual gardeners and of us cultivating a field, uh, tending to the path of light and love upon which the Christ will then walk and we with him. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker is 
Martin Deza, who is from Argentina and Russia. He was born in Argentina in 1985, a student of the Age of Wisdom for more than 10 years. His main fields of service are peace and international politics the synthesis and integration of esoteric groups with particular focus on Ibero-America, and the building of a synergistic space where ideas, resources and servers can meet in resonance to externalize the new age. Martin works as a diplomat for his country and is currently appointed in Moscow. I'd like to read something he wrote that um, during our, our pre-conference planning. He said this, if I may emphasize something, it would be the good news and the positive steps we are making towards the externalization of the hierarchy, not just standing among chaos, but also standing as the path among chaos in a loving and humble way, but also ready to focus the energy in building rather than in enduring what others may not be doing correctly. And this, of course, is an echo of what Michael Linfield has just said. So today, Martin will be speaking on the topic of preparing material conditions for the externalization of the hierarchy and the reappearance of Christ. Welcome, Martin. Thank you. Claire, thank you everyone. I hope uh, you can see me well. I'd like, uh, of course, to add uh, another note to this uh, wonderful event that we are sharing. Um, that is uh, the note of uh, the material reality. We are, um, well, of course, focused on several issues as we are part of uh, a very wide field of consciousness. And uh, I understand, and we, we have already talked with many of you before, that uh, if we consider that the whole manifestation is energy in different uh, levels of vibration, different rays, different qualities, a very important part uh, has to do with uh, the material conditions that we see in the planet today as part of the body of the Christ, as part of uh, the process of the externalization of the hierarchy. So, what can we say about that? Mm, I perhaps the main thing when that comes to my mind when when we we focus on this is that like a dual a dual reality. On one side, we see that uh, uh, we have the vision of uh, what's going on in the world and what can be what can be done in order to go forward in the world with this. Uh, vision of the reappearance of the Christ, the externalization of the hierarchy. And uh, we understand that we have done a very a big, important progress throughout the uh, centuries. But at the same time, we have a, a level of uh, this, uh, stress, a level of uh, something that is not going on well in the world, uh, a note of uh, um, not harmony, so to say. And uh, I see that many, you also see that uh, we, we have in the world inequality, we have poverty, we have uh, uh, violence, we have war, we have hunger. And uh, I wonder if uh, this is part of the plan. I wonder if uh, we are um, doing enough as servers, as part of humanity. I wonder if uh, and this has an energetic meaning and uh, if it is, it is actually, um, let's say, a hindrance to the, uh, the process of reappearance and externalization. And uh, there are, of course, a lot of studies, a lot of figures, how everything is going in the world. Uh, now I hope you can see on the screen some, some facts, some figures. I won't read them all, just uh, a few of them. We, we are now the human family, we are 7. Point billion people. 66, only 66 people own half of the world assets. That is, uh, or as I see it, that uh, half of the energy of money in the world is in hands of 66 people. And uh, we also see that uh, 
that's around 800 uh, million people who are undernourished and we are throwing away 1.3 billion tons of food every year and uh, at the same time we have 2 billion people who are uh, overweight so to say mm, we also see there that is uh, uh, there is something that is not in balance of course and uh, there's this vision this understanding that uh, we we have enough uh, maybe to to uh, to feel and, and, and to realize justice in the world but for some reason these energetic ties are so strong uh, you know there's a um, for example in case of money we have the, the mental ties the structures the organizational structures in the world financial ones uh, are also um, keeping all this energy away from those who need it so this poses uh, some very important questions in my opinion because uh, if we see ourselves as part of the externalization process if we see ourselves as part of the inside the aura of the Christ of the hierarchy uh, we are of course responsible of the energetic unfoldment of all this process and uh, what can we do what, what, what else can we do in order to help this process develop unfold uh, maybe the main the main question is uh, where's the gap? Well, uh, what what is it there in the energetic field of humanity that we cannot uh, solve right now? Uh, probably, if we can sound a clear note, a clearer note of uh, of love, of sharing, uh, the externalization process will speed up. And uh, after uh, the externalization process is uh, completed, uh, after, for example, that the Christ energy is uh, fully anchored in the world, uh, we also have some work to do later. We, we have to consider that uh, we are responsible of creating, as humanity, the energetic uh, uh, structures, the energetic lines of distribution of this energy. So uh, there are many fields in which we can direct this energy. And uh, we, as esoteric uh, servers, probably are uh, very focused on what happens in the in the higher planes. But what if we need to do something else in the in the etheric plane? Today we talked about the will and the importance uh, that the will has in the unfoldment of this process. What if uh, this will needs to be expressed on the etheric plane? What if we, uh, it makes a difference on these planes? Uh, or talking practically, what if we as servers are perhaps focused a little bit on what's going on in the mental plane and we are not allowing the energy to flow through us on, on the etheric plane, on the emotional plane, clearing up everything that is there. And maybe if we, if we try to engage a bit more on, on, on what's going on in the world, we can help, we can give a hand to those who are raising, to those who are emerging with projects, with ideas, with uh, perhaps resources. And we become magnetic points of uh, attraction, of uh, like a bridge uh, for the resources and uh, the energetic energy that are so up there. So perhaps uh, there's a nice phrase from Agni Yoga that you can see on the screen. In some reason, we, we can believe that uh, the ashram synthesis that is integrating now, that we, we have right on the book that is integrating, it deals with some wider energies, uh, that is seventh ray, first ray, second ray, and probably all the rays are in display as uh, we, we can see them through our soul, through our personality, through the mental field of humanity. And uh, at some point, uh, we need to realize, perhaps, that it's not only about uh, some close fields, but also about uh, trying to engage with something new, something that may be more challenging for us, because uh, we are sometimes in a zone of comfort, where uh, trying to connect with the light and trying to, to distribute uh, the teachings, etc., is, is done and it's very important. But uh, in some point we see that uh, in, in the world situation is not changing fast enough, that many people are in pain, that we see pain, we see suffering, we see imbalance in the world. 
And perhaps if we as, as the new group of world servers are uh, more open to this reality, uh, we can foster, uh, uh, speed up the change trying to foster a new reality uh, with a more solid uh, base. So, of course, I, I have many questions to share with you. Uh, I hope uh, we can try to to make a group reflection about this and, and trying to combine it later with the, the other speaker has to say what the, the previous speaker has said around the, the whole process that has to do with the reappearance. But probably the, the, the main conclusion is that there's a, a material dimension in preparing the way. Uh, something needs to be done in this sense. And probably we, if we engage it energetically, if we try to find the energetic uh, uh, substance of all this, uh, we can help uh, to to bridge the gap and let the Christ energy throw flow through humanity more clearly, more purely. So that's uh, all for now. I hope uh, we can meet uh, in some minutes and, 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 and try to explore together uh, what else we have to say. We we have to uh, to share in terms of uh, better expression of uh, spiritual energy in all dimensions. Thank you. Martin, thank you. I feel very um, moved and motivated by your comments that's to do with us identifying the gap and not only identifying it, but addressing it so that we can anchor Christ's love in practical ways. And also the fact we, we are responsible as a new group of world servers for, for creating um, both an energetic and a material field. Again, there's the field that Michael talked about, Michael Linfield talked about, um, that's in support of the reappear reappearance of Christ, of the Christ. So um, thank you very much for your contribution. We look forward to expanding these ideas in the breakout sessions later. Our next speaker is Dot Mather, also I'm sure known to many of you. Dot is an educator and a peace builder whose keynote is inspiring cooperation on behalf of the common good. Her work in education and politics and grassroots community organizing is focused on creating the conditions for a culture of peace, living in harmonious relationship with self, with others, and with all, love, all life. I've had the pleasure of meeting Dot um, at, I think, two SRI conferences in Phoenix. I was immediately warmed by her warmth and also um, her gift for using voice, uh, both spoken and through song, as an instrument of peace building. Less than 24 hours ago, Dot sent an email to today's presenters, and in it, she, had a, she sent a photograph of Mount Kailash and just one single exuberant um, sentence. She said, joyous World Invocation Day, looking forward to the sharing and group work in the spirit of peace, Dot. Dot will speak to us today on the work and the vision that she's so dedicated to a culture of peace and manifesting right human relations. Welcome, Dot. Thank you, Claire. And thank you, everyone, for connecting hearts across distance right now with everyone on this call and those who are tuning in. It's a joy to participate as we gather intentionally in community to draw through the WESAC impulse with a focus on will and the will to good, as we have, have heard and continue to share, working with the energies available through Gemini. Uh, it is striking that this online conference follows the will of the way, the Seven Ray Institute conference, and invoking the will of Shambhala, the Arcane School conference, with our focus today on alignment with the impulse of the higher interlude, impression and expression. In a way, these conferences are all part of one conference with different timings and anchoring points on the planet. 
it seems the most significant thing the new group of world servers can do at this moment in time is dare to act as, to realize our oneness, thereby at once offering a united mass appeal and a united active expression of right human relationship as we realize a culture of peace, a culture that promotes peaceable diversity involving constant shaping and reshaping of understandings, situations, and behaviors to sustain well-being for all. From Esoteric Psychology, Volume 2, your major job at this time is not to wrestle with the power of evil and the forces of darkness, but to awaken an interest in and mobilize the forces of light in the world today. Resist not evil, but so organize and mobilize the good and so strengthen the hands of the workers on the side of righteousness and love. Love that evil will find less opportunity. We face an unprecedented opportunity right now at this Gemini full moon. Let's share the story that excites our hearts, a story of a love so great that it is the essence of life itself. Once upon a time, the Christ and Buddha made an agreement with the full support of the powers that lovingly watch over and guide humanity. At the high point of the spiritual year in May, on the full moon of Wisak, they assist in opening a direct line from humanity to Shambhala. It's like a hotline to God via spiritual demand. So Wisak is a focus on Buddha and the spirit of appeal. If that mass appeal, that spirit of demand is vital enough, it evokes from the Christ a response. When is it that response occurs? At the immediately following full moon in June, the Festival of Humanity and World Invocation Day. And in Tibet, this day is celebrated as the Sagadawa at Mount Kailash in Tibet. Thus, if humanity responds at Wisak and does its part and massed intent and demand is vital enough Christ becomes the very spirit of invocation, which he voices at this Gemini full moon. That invocation in turn evokes response from the lords of liberation, who then give the impetus to enable the rider from the secret place to come forth. Seriously, how good is this? We are conscious of being conscious as individuals and as a group. And we have chosen in this moment to be together virtually, to focus on this story and to utilize the will to good to play our part. In this moment on the human journey, as we experience an all systems breakdown, as we shift from a worldview whose use by date is up, as we struggle sometimes to take a long view. Thank you, 2025 initiative for providing an opportunity for the new group of world servers to explore and express an all systems breakthrough, the emerging new worldview from the perspective of knowing that all is well and according to plan. Because that's actually what's happening out here. And yes, it's a crisis. That means both danger and opportunity. The danger doing business as usual the opportunity to realize a culture of peace, of living in right relationship with self, others, and all life, within the knowing that we are all one, and it's about all the kingdoms. In order to meet this crisis, we are needed to cooperate as a group, beyond our individual selves in group. Why? Because while the law of attraction with its counterparts, repulse and radiation, is always operational in the science of right human relationship in this second race system. It is the law of magnetic impulse that is accessed only by a group and only when we come together around shared purpose. The law of magnetic impulse, the new group of world servers as a group, this is key. From Esoteric Psychology 2, the aggregated aspiration consecration and intelligent devotion of the group 
carries the individuals of which it is composed to greater heights than would be possible alone. The group stimulation and the united efforts sweep the entire group to an intensity of realization that would otherwise be impossible. Just as the law of attraction, working on the physical plane, brought them together as men and women into one group effort, so the law of magnetic impulse can begin to control them when, again as a group, and only as a group, they unitedly constitute themselves channels for service in pure self-forgetfulness. It makes one mindful of the Tibetans' consistent wording, together and as a group. A point regarding Gemini from Esoteric Astrology. Gemini is the constellation of the resolution of duality into a fluid synthesis. It's a shift from duality to unitive consciousness. Humanity is beginning to think, speak, and act accordingly out here. There is lots of talk and action in relation to interconnectedness, our oneness, shared responsibility. There are many trends to talk about. Yet prior to naming and celebrating trends of right human relationship, let's define right relationship and then ponder for just a moment the role Gemini plays in the science of triangles. Right human relations is love in action. Goodwill is love in action. Right human relationship is goodwill, love in action with ourselves, with others, and with every level of life on this beautiful planet we all call home and with the fifth kingdom, as Michael spoke of. Now, Gemini keeps the zodiacal opposites fluid and preserves a magnetic interplay between them. Thus, we have the ultimate promise of right relationship from Gemini. Transmutation into unity. The two finally become the one with a fusion in consciousness of zodiacal polar opposites. This is known as the freedom of the two. For example, Aquarius and Leo, Aquarius group, Leo individual. Now when they offer their gifts to one another, a synthesis occurs and the individual serves on behalf of the common good. We could do that with every point astrologically. So here's the cool thing about this. Gemini is the apex of six zodiacal triangles with Pisces standing in when Gemini and Sagittarius are the two opposite points. Gemini, the twins, two stars, Castor and Pollux, one waning, the other waxing, representing soul and personality. Libra, the overseer of right human relationship, serves to bring Gemini into balance, leading to Aquarian expression in world service. The point? Unitive consciousness, the living recognition that all is one. There is no separation. Maybe one of the reasons Gemini gets to play this amazing role as facilitator of oneness, where gifts of polar opposites synthesize, is that Gemini forms a point of entrance for cosmic energy from Sirius, the dog star. So let's look at the trends we are seeing through the lens of a solutions-oriented, loving approach. Trends that demonstrate right human relationship. Keeping in mind the importance of triangles and the other keynotes of Gemini, including goodwill, freedom, and the shift from duality to unitive consciousness. There are numerous signs around the world that the science of right human relationship is the very fabric of global citizenship as we lay the foundation stones for a culture of peace. Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Let's name some trends. United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, a global blueprint for the culture of peace. The 2025 initiative presents us with monthly opportunities to explore these goals. 
Mother Earth is recognized as a sacred sentient being with attendant protections. Bolivia and Mexico have now passed laws. Other countries are considering. And we are working in every country to protect sacred lands. Sharing. Sharing.org. Community gardens. Crop swap. A sharing economy. Bike sharing. Car sharing. Garden tool sharing. House sharing. And more. Regenerative living economy. Consider this. Eco means home. Nomi, system of management. So the question becomes, how do we manage our global home? Maybe it's not just about money. Consider Bhutan and gross national happiness. Not GNP or gross national product. There's a conscious demand for, and in many locales, a shift from fossil fuels. 350.org, climate change marches, solar capacity is increasing everywhere. We have only to look in the direction of Morocco and Germany. The organic food movement, the clean water movement, the seed movement, the mindfulness movement, socially responsible businesses, youth leadership, Global Youth Rising, Generation Waking Up, WeDay.org, Transpartisan Politics, the exploration to look beyond polarized politics, rather politics on behalf of the common good, a gradual shift in health care from a focus on illness to a focus on well-being. The Good News Network tells real life stories every day that remind us we are conscious and caring and connected. A systems approach to breaking the cycle of violence. Co-creative emergent design processes are leading to comprehensive approaches in communities where in the United States and around the world, we are working together for safe communities. Restorative justice, the shift from punishment to restoration, no longer privatizing the criminal justice system. And a trend that is close to my heart, peace building. As Sharon Deep recently shared, we all want goodwill. Yet we tend to get stuck, not sure what to do. We need tools to get to another place, a peace builder's toolkit. Tools, they come on all levels. Tools of a personal practice through which we empower ourselves to live in right relationship with self. Tools such as social emotional learning, nonviolent communication, anger management, empathy, mediation, conflict resolution restorative justice, understanding that unmet needs drive behavior, and that we are more than our behavior. Tools, skills in support of living in right relationship with others. And tools to support us living in right relationship with all life. These are the essential, essential pieces of a culture of peace. And everything is about relationship. And at the United Nations, the question is asked, is peace a human right? Now, every time humanity asks a big question, we make a big shift. And it may take us a while to get there. In fact, we're still working on these two. But for example, should women have the vote? Is slavery acceptable? We are now asking, is peace a human right? There are more trends to be recognized, to be named, to be willfully lived as we move into this next phase of life in Aquarius. This is our story. It is the story of our next zodiacal turn on the wheel. Under the influence of Aquarius, we are the storytellers. It is the time of group, the time of communication beyond what we presently experience, the time of freedom the time of living together in right relationship. Finally, as we prepare to break into smaller groups, 
never losing sight of our one groupness, let us consider the situation we find ourselves in as we approach 2025. And may we discover together how best to serve and prepare the way. Let us consider communication on all levels and from the center of the even-armed cross, vertically and horizontally. Let us consider the science of right human relations and our role as storytellers and sharers of good news through our own life demonstrations, through our speech, through our group work, and through our subjective focus. As Michael Lindfield said, acting as is the path of living discipleship. We are called upon to make a difference right now. So as we break into groups and dialogue, dialogue may we act as with the realization that we are a living, loving laboratory of right human relationship. May the spirit of peace be spread abroad in our hearts, through our groups, and throughout the world. Om Shanti. Yes, you doubt. That was beautiful. And thank you also for um, leading us into our breakout sessions, um, which is really an opportunity to put so much of what you've been saying and what all the speakers have been saying this morning into practical action. Um, it's underlining what you just talked about, about group, um, group effort and group stimulation, united effort, um, and about everything being about relationship. So thank you. It was really beautiful and powerful. So we've um, reached the stage in this morning's um, process where um, we'll be soon breaking out into smaller group discussion. Um, before we do that, we're going to have a musical interlude just to help us ground uh, some of the, the um, points that have been made this morning. And I think Alexander, that's something that you'll be able to help us with. This is a piece called Listen to the Voices by Holly Near with um, a duo, an a cappella duo, Gimmer's Revolution. So that's where our experimental part of um, our work begins. So there, um, we will do our best to play the music and uh, if not, then we will try to keep the silence ground in the energy. Listen to the voices of the First Nations. Mm. Listen to the voices of the First Nations. Calling out the messages of the earth and sky. Telling us what we need to know in order to survive. Listen to the voices of the First Nations. Listen to the voices of the old women. Mm. 
Listen to the voices of the old women Calling out the messages of the moon and sea Telling us what we need to know in order to be free Listen to the voices of the old women mm. Listen to the voices of the young children Mm. Listen to the voices of the young children Calling out the messages of the heart and soul Telling us what we used to know before the lies were told Listen to the voices of the young children mm. oh. 